The 17th century was probably the most important century in the making of the modern world. This was the century in which Galileo Galilei and Isaac Newton laid the foundations for modern science. Descartes began the practice of modern philosophy. Hugo Grotius initiated the basic tenets of international law. And Thomas Hobbes and John Locke initiated modern political theory. In the same century, strong centralized European states entered into worldwide competition for wealth and power, accelerating the pace of colonization in the American and Asian continents. The Dutch, the French, the Spanish, the Portuguese and the English, they all began to extend colonies and trading posts in distant corners of the globe, with profound and permanent consequences. They even fought one another in Europe, where warfare grew increasingly complex and expensive. To gain an edge over the other powers in war, European governments initiated research in military technology. The 17th century can, therefore, be considered an age of military revolution, enabling European powers to establish military supremacy over non-European armies relatively easily. However, several historians have pointed out that this century was also an era of general crisis in Europe. What was the cause of this crisis or what was the significance of this crisis? There is no consensus among historians regarding this. But it is undeniable that in the 17th century or the 17th century was a period of political upheaval in Europe. If you look at the various European states that existed during that time, whether it was the Palatinate, whether it was Bohemia or the Germanies, Catalonia, Portugal, Ireland, England, and later also Scotland, Holland, Sweden, Italy, Ukraine, Muscovy, and the Ottoman Empire within Europe. We find that there was some kind of problem or the other in all these areas. In fact, if you are talking about a crisis, this crisis spilled even outside Europe and one witnesses upheavals in areas like Brazil, India and China during this time. Historian Hugh Trevor Roper in his article entitled The General Crisis of the 17th Century, written in 1959, wrote about a crisis in the relations between society and the state. Trevor Roper argued that the middle years of the 17th century in Western Europe saw a widespread breakdown in polity, economy and society, caused by a complex series of demographic, religious, economic and political developments. In this general crisis, various events such as the English Civil War, the Fronde or civil disturbances in France, the Thirty Years' War in Germany, and revolts against the Spanish crown in Portugal, Naples and Catalonia, were all manifestations of the same problem. All historians uh, agree to this reality in Europe that in the 17th century Europe was ravaged either by civil wars or revolution or warfare of some kind or the other. We will turn our attention to the three major wars that was fought in Europe during the 17th century and these three crucial conflicts was one with Habsburg Spain against um, the uh, with France and the Dutch Republic or against France and the Dutch Republic. The rivalry of Sweden and Poland which eventually ruined both Denmark and Russia and the confrontation between the Austrian Habsburgs and their estates of their hereditary provinces. Not only this, Europe witnessed numerous peasant revolts, numerous urban disturbances in the 17th century. Now the general crisis was co constituted by two contemporaneous but two separate regions. One was a local region. Uh, uh, reason. We have individual local political con confrontations which may or may not have developed into 
revolutions. And on the other hand, there was a general crisis, a crisis in economics and a crisis in a de uh, demography, a demographic crisis. And both these crises were both political and non-political. The most important cause of the general crisis, in Trevor Roper's opinion, was the conflict between the court and the country. That is, between the increasingly powerful, centralized, bureaucratic, sovereign princely states represented by the court and the traditional, regional, land-based aristocracy and gentry representing the country. In addition, the intellectual and religious changes wrought by the Reformation and the Renaissance were the secondary, though very important, causes of the general crisis. One must turn one's attention to the geography of Europe during this time. There were certain geographical changes occurring in Europe at this time. Now, we find that there are historians, there are meteorologists, there are physicists who are of the opinion that this was the period when Europe was witnessing what was called the Little Ice Age. There was a marked uh, change in temperature with the temperature becoming cooler and with much wetter summers. The general crisis overlaps fairly neatly with the Little Ice Age, which is believed to have occurred in the 17th century. The Little Ice Age was a fairly long period of relatively low solar activities, giving rise to cold winters and wet summers. Apparently, this should not have hampered the course of history. But one must keep in mind the Europe that we are talking about. A Europe which is dependent on agriculture both for uh, its trade as well as for its nutrition. So the agricultural output is very important and agricultural output is directly linked to geographical conditions. So the geographical changes that was occurring or that were occurring in the 17th century according to a certain class of historians was very important and it caused a lot of economic hardships as far as 17th century Europe is concerned. During the Little Ice Age, glaciers in the Swiss Alps advanced, gradually engulfing farms and crushing entire villages. The River Thames and the canals and rivers of the Netherlands often froze during the winter and people skated and even held frost fairs on the ice. The first Thames Frost Fair was organized in 1607. The last was held in 1814. The freezing of the Golden Horn and the southern section of the Bosphorus Strait occurred in 1622. In 1658, a Swedish army marched across the Great Belt to Denmark and invaded Copenhagen. The Baltic Sea froze, making possible sledge rides from Poland to Sweden, with night halls and seasonal inns built on the way. The winter of 1794-95 was particularly harsh when the French invasion army under General Charles Pechigru marched over the frozen rivers of the Netherlands with the Dutch fleet locked in the ice at Dan Helder Harbour. Sea ice surrounding Iceland extended up to several miles in every direction, closing the island's harbours to shipping. The severe climate change brought in its wake abrupt demographic changes. Coupled with this, because of this change in the weather, we find several the outbreak of several diseases. And one must keep in mind the fact that medical science had not progressed to that extent which would enable the various, medical, uh, the various doctors or whoever was associated with the medical profession to tackle this problem. We have the outbreak of the bubonic plague. You have the outbreak of influenza. You have the outbreak of various other epidemics which resulted in what which resulted in depopulation now 
16th century Europe had witnessed a growth in the population and this growth in population had been halted in the 17th century, one because of the outbreak of epidemics, second because of the various wars that were being fought in Europe at this time and one can turn uh, one's attention to the 30 years war that's, uh, that was fought. It was in fact fought in continental Europe but its repercussions were felt throughout Europe which you we all know resulted in a significant loss of population. So, on the one hand, there was a decline in productivity. On the other hand, there was a decline in the population. So, the decline in population was the uh, was exacerbated the economic crisis as well as the demographic crisis was exacerbated by the. Uh, incessant wars between the various European powers at this time. Incessant wars put increasing pressures on the taxpayers. High taxes for defence spending depressed economic life, even in areas not affected by fighting. Actually, the economic crisis and the political crisis go hand in hand together because the moment you f uh, uh, face economic hardships, there's bound to be revolts, revolts from the have-nots in society. There was not only the revolts from the have-nots in society, we also have certain uh, 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 sort of a climate of discontent as far as the uh, cap uh, business class or the trading classes are concerned. They would want a say in the government which they were not getting. So there was this discontentment among the mercantile capitalist classes, if you can call them that, and the discontent that existed in the lower rungs of society, specifically among the peasants and uh, the laborers without work, they were utilizing these discontents and that is why we find so many urban disturbances as well as the rural revolts. Moreover, this was the time when we find the monarchy actually try, trying to thought that the, the monarchy, the renaissance monarchy is actually uh, in its waning years, it is facing a period of decadence. And to keep intact its former position, it is imposing certain uh, legislations which were or it was imposing certain rules which were um, not people friendly. For example, the various taxations. What, was, what were the taxations actually about? It was the attempt by the uh, rule, rule, ruling elite to tax the people so that they could keep uh, uh, the standards that prevailed before the 17th century intact. Another reason as to why the people were being taxed was because of the war phase. Now the wars had to be funded from somewhere and obviously the burden of the war fell on the people in ways uh, in, in, in the way of taxation. Then the church also played its role by imposing various tithes on the people. So the, the political situation and the economic situation actually work together to make the crisis or to take the crisis to such an extent that throughout Europe we do find some kind of a disturbance or the other in the 17th century. In the southwestern France, rebels known as Croquants in 1634 rose in arms to demand a return to traditional taxes. No new taxes, they said, unless an estates general agreed to them. In Normandy, there was the revolt of the new peers in 1639. Here, there had been a plague, leaving fewer taxpayers to pay current levies. At Porto, a peasants' assembly ordered their constituents to keep and bear arms and be ready to act when the alarm was given. Various manifestos catalogued popular grievances, stating that the people, already impoverished, have been obliged to fall into debt or mortgage their land to townspeople or to the privileged persons of the locality. In the end, rebels were forced to yield, though assaults on tax collectors and other royal agents continued into 1642. Local officials went on strike. Makers of the playing cards and tarot cards struck. <laughs> 
tavern owners stirred people up against new taxes on wine. Prominent gentlemen were involved in the illegal salt trade. Salt makers were at the heart of the revolt. Similar unrests took place in Brittany in the 1670s. In these cases, too, the revolts were suppressed without major bloodshed. When we talk about the 17th century crisis, there are many historians who would want us to believe that the crisis began somewhere in the 1620s and ended either in the 1670s or trailed right to say, the 1715 in different areas. But what is significant regarding this crisis was this, that all of Europe did not witness the crisis with the same intensity and at the same time. For example, if you look at the um, important centers of economic activity in Europe, it had been the Baltic region and it was later on, um, it was Spain and Portugal. But this was the time when we see the decline of these areas and the growth of two new countries which were based uh, uh, in northwestern Europe, uh, specifically the countries around the North Sea region. One is England, the other is Holland. And one can ask the question, why is it that in a period of general economic crisis or in a period of general crisis in Europe, we find the development um, or we find uh, the progress of England and Holland? Now, historians say that the developments in England was actually a signify, uh, or it actually signified a transition from what? From feudalism to capitalism. Okay. And in Holland also we find, at least till the middle of the 17th century, we find the growth of mercantilist capital, which resulted in the development or the progress of Holland. For England, it was the growth of mercantilist capital, uh, 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 the mercantilist capital, then we have the growth of, uh, or we have the agricultural revolution, you have the commercial revolution, and ultimately all this led to the industrial revolution, something that did not happen in Holland. The industrial revolution gained momentum in England from the beginning of the 18th century. This phase was marked by a technological change in which manufacturing began to rely on steam power fueled primarily by coal. Some historians see the Industrial Revolution as the outcome of the social changes wrought by the Enlightenment and the colonial expansion of the 17th century. The extractive um, colonialism of Portugal and Spain had become redundant. Now we have what is called the plantation capitalism. Now we have um, Specifically, if you take up the example of England, we will see that England is introducing plantations in her colonies for what? So that she can get a supply of raw materials and these colonies could also be used as a steady market for her products. So this period was a transitional period from uh, what was or what has been called by historians as extractive colonialism to the period of plantation colonialism. And because of this transition, there was uh, chaos and there was disturbances in 17th century Europe. Ma'am, Ekhetri England and Joshua Bhogoli Kabustan talk is a dai chilo bola jai. England geographically was in a very advantageous position because it was an island. It was um, cut off from the real politics that prevailed in continental Europe uh, because of its geography. It was, you know, surrounded by seas. So, of course, it could remain a little aloof. Secondly, because of uh, the, uh, the whole of England uh, being very close to the sea, the people by nature were seafaring. And the other important aspect of England is that we find the uh, kingship or the ruler playing a very positive role. Geography did play a significant part in, uh, in um, as far as the development of England is concerned, but it was not merely geography. It was the way, um, it was uh, on the one hand, the role that parliament played, it was on the other hand, the rise of the yeoman farmers, it was on the other hand, the rise of uh, the capitalist tenants, the rise of uh, a gentry class. 
and in England as from the 16th century onwards one witnesses a collusion or one uh, witnesses um, a kind of a compromise formula being chalked out between the royalty the aristocracy and the capitalist classes as the capitalist classes whose uh, source of wealth was not land but whose source of wealth was trade this was something which is very unique to england uh, uh, the rest of europe did not witness this ma'am ei shomoy eta notun obhijata shrenir udbhav hocche tar phole ki krishi somporke khetre kono rokom poriborton asche in england specifically after the uh, uh, rule of parliament comes into the fore we find that the concept of the commons is no longer there we find land being enclosed we find small farmers being forced to sell their land to the capitalist farmers the relationship between a capitalist farmer the and uh, or the relationship between the aristocracy the landed aristocracy the capitalist tenant and the peasant in england is one of, of what the peasants are actually in due course of time turning into wage laborers where the capitalist tenants are concerned they are actually becoming the improving farmers which ultimately results in the agricultural revolution in england but look at the case of germany and france it's so very different because what we find the intensification of feudalistic practices in germany and france the same situation prevailed or basic uh, similarities prevailed in europe as far as the economics was concerned in the 16th century but the local conditions transformed these same situations into different things for different countries danish historian niels steensgaard speaks of a transference of production to the country districts in order to dodge the guild regulations and taxation of the towns that transfer was central to what historians now refer to as proto industrialization ma'am proto industrialization ei samasya tar mokabila korte koto ta sahajjo korechilo proto industrialization is industrialization at the village level that is where uh, a household ventures into activity which is not directly associated with agriculture now proto industrialization again is dependent on a few factors that is proto industrialization is something where uh, a man or his family practices uh, or does a few things so that he can be self sufficient in proto industrialization it is not production for the market okay. mm -hmm. it is production for self sufficiency but at the same time one must understand something that and in proto industrialization there is no specialization as such when you are producing for the market there is specialization but proto industrialization again if you come to the question of england it did help because you do find that once the land was confiscated or once the land you know actually passed from the hands of the peasants where the free peasantry ceased to exist they became wage laborers we find them flocking to the villages in search of employment which in its turn triggered off um a kind of um, a reaction whereby you find the development of industries even in the rural areas in england which had access to the wage labor and they could dictate terms to these uh, wage laborers because these wage laborers had nowhere else to go so this again was replicated in the urban areas later this uh, where we find the shift in industries from the rural to the urban areas specifically when we find that england started producing for the market and the 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 experience of proto uh, industrialization should have helped in in fact it did help ma'am colony te je ora plantation economy koche so তার পরিপূরক হিসেবে দেশগুলোর মধ্যে যদি নিবিচ্ছাস বা কৃষি সম্প্রসারণ করে তাহলে তো সংকটের মোকাবিলা খাঁটা করা যায় কিন্তু সেই উদ্যোগ কি দেখা গেছিল ইউরোপে with the colonies is concerned one advantage of the colonies is that it's a captive market you can dictate your terms to the captive market whereas with the european powers are concerned each have uh, their own set of um, demands 
they owns or, or, and each have to actually um, take into context the ground reality that prevail in their country the various pressures that prevail in their country and accordingly the real politics of these countries were shaped so if there is inter regional trade in europe then these things would have to be uh, uh, would be uh, uh, would have to be taken into context but with the colonies concerned you do not actually have to take these things into con uh, context because it's a captive market of yours you dictate terms there whereas in europe it is not possible for one part to dictate terms to the other mam 14th century crisis or the 17th century crisis are key parthakya the in the 14th century one major problem of europe is it had not yet ventured out in the 17th century from the 16th century onwards we find europe venturing out the advantage of colonial items in the 14th century i will not say europe did not have an access to products which were produced outside europe but then it came about in a very uh, complicated and roundabout way and it was mainly the products of luxury where you're talking about the 17th century look at the products that are coming from the colonies it, it, it these are the products which are for mass consumption this is the major difference where we find that the formation of colonies is actually uh, trying to resolve the kind of economic crisis that prevailed in europe at that time 14th century europe would have to follow an inclusive policy because there was no way out in the 17th century the fortune of spain declined but that of france rose making her the greatest power in europe louis the 14th increased his powers at home and abroad to oppose him other powers laid aside their religious differences and joined forces against france By the end of the century, two powers in particular were competing with France for economic supremacy, namely Holland and England.